Good morning. Welcome to our class together today. Today we're going to cover Philippians 3, the first 14 verses. This is a class in which Paul tries to describe what we all need to release and what we need to hold on to. It's not an easy topic because we want to hold on to the wrong things and let go of the right things. So today, as we begin our class, you'll hear us talk about that in our classroom. Unfortunately, you're not able to hear comments from students because we just don't have the technical capability to do that. But I've tried to report, repeat as much as I can so you can get the essence of it. But I hope you enjoyed this class, and next week we'll continue again. So enjoy today's lesson as we study Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Let's assume that you are going to go uh, on a two-week trip to Paris. Two-week trip to Paris requires a certain amount of packing. So you pack everything you've got, you get to the airport, they put it on the scale, and they ask you the question, they, they say they say to you, say, this is four pounds too heavy. You have to take something out. Are you going to take out? You ever had that going one? Sure. What do you take out? It's too heavy. What is it? Winter or summer? <laughs> <laughs> I can I can give you my next example though won't make a lot of difference to that question. So just assume it's going to be summer. So long pants. Long pants. Okay. Well, you're from Italy, so you, you know what to do there. <laughs> Americans aren't like you. <laughs> we do all kinds of other things. And, uh, I asked that question because that happened to me. One year I went to Nicaragua. Now, I have to give you an explanation. When I'm going to Nicaragua, Grace would bring all kinds of stuff I'm supposed to take. Medicines, eyeglasses, salves, potions, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. you got to take this down there. I said, if I put all this in there, I may not have room for my clothes. She said, well, leave your clothes, take this. <laughs> uh, one year I got to the airport, and I had exactly the same thing happen to me. The guy said, you're three pounds too heavy. You have to take something out. Now, I'm going to a country in which there's not a Walmart. <laughs> if I'm going to the United States and I know I can go buy something, big deal, no big deal. I, but then I had to make the decision, what do I take out? Well, I took out a couple of quick shirts and and thought, well, I did wear two uh, days in a row, and that worked. Um, but the problem is that what you have to decide suddenly is to take out. Now, one year, that happened to me, so I took out something I should have kept. This is 2011. In 2011, as you remember, um, that was the year that Dallas hosted the Super Bowl, and we went uh, Nick Ron with the week of the Super Bowl. And we were coming back through Houston, and they closed the airport in Houston, and they closed the airport in Dallas. And I had packed, this is where Susie's issue comes in, I had packed for 98 degree weather. I got off the plane in Houston, it's 28 degrees. I had short sleeve t-shirts, all I had. From then on, I don't care what I left at the airport, I've got a portable coat I carry it with me no matter which climate I'm going to for that particular reason. It, it's interesting because you have to sit down and figure out what's important and what isn't. Right now we're doing something that uh, my wife has wanted to do forever, so she waited for me to retire uh, so she can kill me quickly. And that is clean out our attic. Um, what that means basically is that I crawl up these stairs and let my joints tell me stop doing that and haul stuff down that we haven't used in 23 years, so we can put it out on the curb, uh, thinking that we've done well. I still have half of it to go. Um, but the question you start to have me ask is, is this going to be valuable to me in the future or not? And do I need to keep it or not keep it? Those are interesting kinds of questions. And for Paul in this lesson, he's, he's, uh, he's asking us this question, I think. I, there, there are a lot of things in the lesson today that we talk about. But what do you need to release in order to hold on to something more important? That's a big deal. He has to release a lot of things in this lesson, so he has some has enough room to grasp. 
are you aware you can't hold two things at once? You'll always lose your grip on one of them, as you'll hear later on. Um, so let's take a look at the big picture. Sometimes you come to a point where you need to say, let's back it back out. Let's look at some things and decide what, uh, what we've been looking at, where we need to go. You can take Philippians as four chapters, and they all have a succeeding point. Uh, chapter 1 has a theme of living for Christ. In fact, in, in, uh, as we read in Philippians 1 and verse 27, he said, let your manner of life be one in the gospel of Christ. He's trying to express to them, this is how you are to live. But then he says, when you get to chapter 2, but to do that in peace, harmony, and unity, to strive together, as he says in chapter 1, you have to have the mind of Christ. So now you not just live for Christ, you have to think like him. When you cut to chapter 3, which is where we are today and next week, it's about knowing Christ. Today we're going to get a passage that says that I, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his suffering. There's an Paul says you've got to go more than just think like Christ. You've got to do more than just kind of figure out what to do with things. You've got to have some sort of a, a relational uh, knowledge that's there. And then finally, in chapter 4, he's going to talk about relying on Christ. When you've done all that, then now you can relax and rely on it. If you don't do that, if you don't have the first three, you can't get the last one very well. Or you can look at it this way. In, in Philippians, there's this interesting pattern that, that comes up. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul does teaching. He's very instructive. We've heard him talk about that. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to be. This is how you need to act. Well, then when you get to chapter 4, it gets a little more personal and more exhortative, if you will, where he says, now based on that, I need to tell you some things from my heart. And Paul does that. What that means is this chapter that we're looking at today and next week is really ending the teaching Paul's way to do. And that's why when we get to this passage today, he, uh, he, he starts with a word that we think doesn't look like it's over yet. But the theme, I think, for today's lesson is to, hold, to live for Christ Yet know what to hold on to and what you're after release. Paul's way to do that is explain what he's had to do in his own life. Uh, so the question for us is what does Paul as a prisoner at the end of his life consider by violent what's trivial? You know, when you're 30 years old, everything's important. When you're 70 year old, 70 years old, nothing's important. All that stuff, and you wonder, what did I do that for? Why do I have that? I don't understand it. But when you were younger, it seemed to be important. When you get older, it's a little different. So Paul at this stage says, when I look back at my life, there are things in there that I don't want to have anymore. I don't need them anymore. Uh, so he he's begins this passage by saying, finally. See, this is the place where he says, this is my last thing I want to teach you. This is where I'm going to wrap all of this up before I move on to say, now, let me tell you about some things I want to do with you. He says, I want you to know, brethren, that you can rejoice in the Lord. What I've said, I've written these things to you before. Apparently Paul's been writing up letters. We don't have them. I've written you these things before, and, and it, it's, I'm not reticent to do it. It doesn't bother me to tell you the things I'm trying to tell you. And also, it's for your own spiritual security for you to hear it. Uh, Paul's a big believer that repetition is important. The more times you tell somebody, the more likely they're going to hang on to it. Uh, but he talks about the danger that's going on here. And uh, the danger is, uh, is different than what we think. You have to look at the background of the times. Paul was always being hounded by the, what has been called the Judaizing teachers. In other words, there are those people who come into church, they would say, if you want to be a Christian, you have to be circumcised first because God only accepts the circumcised. And so, even for the Gentiles, they said, you have to be circumcised. And Paul said, who? You don't need to be circumcised. If Christ died for you, you don't have the old law to bind you anymore. But they kept coming along behind and said, 
Paul has, has taught you something, but we need to tell you what's really important. And so there's this constant flow of, of back and forth between the, the Judaizing teachers who are trying to pull people back into the Jewish law, and Paul saying, let's pull you into the, to, to the church. And it's a struggle. He doesn't know what to do with them sometimes, except to say, be, be careful about them. He said, look out for them. And so he turns some things upside down. I like this chapter because Paul takes what's reality and flips it, as you're going to see. Uh, when you turn things upside down, you see things differently. I am not going to demonstrate that. By <laughs> um, I have enough blood rushing to my brain without putting me out by the light. Uh, but Paul turns life upside down here. Uh, he starts by talking about some dogs. Now, dogs, oh my, dogs are cute, they're cuddly, they sleep at your feet, they lick your face, they love you when everybody doesn't. You say, why does he say that? Because that's not the same kind of dog. In the ancient world, dogs were vicious, they were wild. They would roam around in packs, like wolves, like hyenas. And they were attacking. Their fleas would give you diseases. If you wanted to be in a civilized society, you got rid of the dogs. Sometimes that's an important thing. I remember when we lived on the Gulf Coast, um, there was a lady that lived in a certain spot. I visited with her one time. She said, you know, one of the things that happened down the block down here, there was this vacant piece of property and a bunch of trailers had gone on that property. And the, the trailers were, uh, were put there by Vietnamese fishermen that had moved to this country and were trying to fish the water from Galveston Bay and to make a living. And so they moved their families in there. And she said, the strangest things happen. She said, we don't have any stray dogs anymore. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> she didn't say it. I didn't say it. We all understood it. We got rid of them. Huh? Yeah. And when they were seeing the packs of dogs, they would come in and they would try to run the street. That's right. Food and yeah. They'll attack you. They will. And that's that was the problem. These were not pets. These were were things that you wanted to get rid of. They were they were the predators. And so he said, look out for the dogs. Now what I like about this is the term dog was always applied to Gentiles by the Jews. We know that because we read about it in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon. In Tyre and Sidon, they are outside the parameters of Israel. And so he goes and he's, he's teaching. And, he's, and this woman who is a, a, a Gentile woman, a Phoenician woman, comes to him with a child and wants her child to be healed. And what sounds like a very callous response Jesus says it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. <coughs> not bother a lot of people. Jesus only reflecting the Jewish idea. And she says, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. So it eats the child. Uh, but you see that idea, they are the they are the mongrel race, is how the Jews would feel about it. And so the dogs were always something you didn't have. Paul turns it upside down. Let's talk about who the real dogs are now. The real dogs are not the Gentiles. The real dogs are you guys. You're the ones that are the roaming bands of predators. So don't. So beware of the dogs. Those people coming to you to tell you something different. Uh, then he says they mutilate the flesh. Remember, they are of circumcision. Circumcision had a place. God ordained it for Abraham for a good reason. He says, this is so you'll keep my covenant. It was related to their faith and the promise of God. It was related to how they related to God. It was integral to that relationship. <clears throat> and so Abraham... And, his, and every male in his, his camp 
is circumcised because that's the covenant sign. They are in covenant with God because of that. However, if that's not the only reason you circumcise. If you read down in Genesis 34, we have this, uh, this terrible story. And, but it's about um, one of the, the princes of the town of Shechem, who is infatuated with Dinah, who is a daughter of Jacob. And when she spurns his advances, he rapes her. And then he wants to marry her. Twisted idea, but it's there. And so the children, the, the sons of Jacob are so incensed, they're going to wipe out the city. You can't do it in front of Saul. Instead, what they said, well, if you're going to marry our sister, you're all going to have to be circumcised. So they agreed. And they were circumcised, but the problem is when they were in pain after the circumcision, they were attacked and slaughtered. Circumcision there was an act of, of vengeance. It had nothing to do with the covenant. It had nothing to do with the covenant. You could be circumcised and and have nothing to do with the Abrahamic covenant at all. And that's why Paul, when he tells to the Romans, he says, for it, the one who is a Jew, or one, no one is a Jew who is merely outwardly circumcised. Just because you've had the surgery doesn't make you a Jew. But the one who is circumcised is both outward, it is not outward and physical, but is spiritual. He says, one of the things that if you want to talk about circumcision, we need to talk about why. Not just that you've had surgery. So he talks about the mutilators. He said, all they're going around doing is they're wielding a knife. They're mutilators. They're not changing anybody's life. They're not making anybody better. They're not bringing the Christ. They're just mutilating flesh. <clears throat> and, and so Paul was very in, impressed with that. And so he said, so let's talk about something. Let's play a game. The game is called, see if you can top this. You ever play that game? People play it all the time. This, this is how it tends to run. Somebody says, And the other person says, really? You ought to see me. I've got an, M an MRI lately, and it says I should be dead. <laughs> and you top that. Or, i got a raise in work. Really? i got a corner office. <laughs> Who's more important? That's the game. Paul says we're going to play this game, because that's the game you decided we want to play. So he says, let me give you about your, my resume. And he talks about this idea. It's interesting that in two verses he talks about the word confidence three times. Repeated words are important. Confidence. What makes you so confident? What is your overwhelming persuasive proof, that's the word, that says you are right with God and that God is pleased with you? He says that's what confidence is. He says that we of the circumcision, now he's talking about the Christians there, the true spiritual circumcision, who worship the Spirit of God and the glory of Jesus Christ, put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, the outward that we have done is not worth anything. That's not what makes us right with God. He says, though I myself might have reason for confidence, in the flesh also. You guys said how important you are, and how close to God you are, and how much God loves you, and how much you are accepted by God. Okay, let's play it. I have more reason to be confident than you do. And so if you have reason, I've got more. Then he goes on to talk about the persuasive evidence of his standing with God, if he wants to do that. It's interesting what we have in our society. We like to weigh, count, and measure things. 
Um, what is your attendance record at church? <laughs> I've never missed a service. I, I, you know, it's almost like my grandfather, uh, when my father said, well, when I was a kid, I walked through 15 feet of snow going downhill and had to do the same thing coming back. Uh, that's, you know, but a lot of people that I've been there every time church doors are open. Or, you know, you don't understand how much money I've given to that church. Wake out measure. We like metrics. Paul says, so you're going to use metrics to tell me what you like. But, you know, the problem with metrics is they don't measure a lot. Um, you ever know those kids in school? In the last day of school, they got a certificate for perfect attendance. Now, I remember when I graduated from high school, there was one, one guy, one guy had gone all the way from kindergarten to a senior in high school and never missed a day of school. The problem is, when they started ranking students according to their learning, he was at the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> Just because he was there didn't mean he learned anything. And that's the problem Paul's going to bring up. He says, what's the overwhelming evidence? He said, let's look at this. If anyone has confidence in the flesh, I have more. So let's compare. Uh, and he says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. What the law prescribed. Not everybody did. Some people were a day later or two days later or whenever they could get there. Not him. Precise. He was circumcised on the eighth day. Just as the law said. He was of the people of Israel. He had clear bloodlines. He doesn't have any foreign blood in his system. Uh, so he is pure, pure Jew. Uh, a, of the tribe of Benjamin. He had that for a couple of reasons. Benjamin was the tribe that Saul, the first king, came from. He's a Benjaminite. I come from those who started the royal kingdom. And Benjamin was a tribe that stayed with Judah when the kingdom divided under Jeroboam I. We stayed faithful when some of you folks did. You can almost feel the patty. You know, at some point, somebody said, please don't break the law and yourself on the back. He's trying to keep from breaking his arm now. He said, as to a legal law, a Pharisee, I have been very strict. Pharisees were separatists. We are going to keep ourselves separate from all the influences of the Greek culture. And so we are going to go back and reestablish the law. We're going to draw this fence around it. We're going to say you can only go this far on the Sabbath day. This, if you're going to wash, you're going to have to wash this way. When you cleanse the cups, it has to be cleansed this way. There's so many revolutions of, of turning that you have to do in order to do it. Very precise. I was one of those. As to zeal, as to the fire of this, as to my passion, I was a persecutor of the church. I stood there holding the coats of the people who stoned Stephen and because I gave them the approval to do it. I went all the way to Damascus to do one simple thing, and that was to crush this sect called Christianity and make this a pure Jewish system again. As to righteousness under the law of language, look at my record. See if you can find anything I've done wrong. I doubt you can. And so Paul says, do you want to stack up the accomplishments? I got them. He's, he's almost doing what the, the Pharisee did in the, in the parable of Luke 18. Luke 18, Jesus tells this parable about these, uh, about a tax collector and a Pharisee going into the temple to pray. You know the story that the tax collector is penitent. He won't look toward heaven. He's in the corner. Uh, and But the Pharisee said, Lord, I am like, I am not like the other, I'm grateful, I'm not like the other men. I do not rob, I do not steal, and I'm not like this tax collector over here. It's a way of saying, aren't you proud to have somebody like me? Aren't you glad I'm a member of this church? I don't care. <laughs> Paul says, that's what I can do. I have to. But he said, but whatever I gain, I have. Whatever payment that came from that, I count. I thought 
about it. I realized I need to get rid of that for the sake of Christ. The things I saw were proper were not profitable. They weren't getting anywhere. There's a story that's told of a man who had a, a consultant went into his office. He was hired because his business was not doing well. And uh, when he went into the CEO's office, it was lined with, lined with, with pictures of him with famous people. And he started talking to all the people he had met. The consultant finally said to him, he said, I'm very impressed by what you have done. But what are you doing now? And it hit him like a brick. He grabbed the trash can and started throwing away all the pictures. Paul's throwing away all his pictures. He's getting rid of this photo album. All that stuff doesn't make any difference. I want you to think about what he's saying here. Someone has said that being religious is just as dangerous as being irreligious. See, being irreligious makes you wicked. Being religious can make you prideful and irreligious. Not a lot of difference in those two things. The man who's irreligious believes that he can be his own God. The man who is religious can believe he is God. Same thing. And, and so Paul describes that dilemma and the reason for that is you start to depend on what you do for your spiritual security. I'm good because of what I do. And it's not what you do, it's who you are that makes the difference in life. Um, and really the truth be told, you can be pretty religious without ever being converted. You know, there are people who come to this church three days a week and they do it because that's what they've always taught to do or that's what they've always done or it's their habit or they like the people. It has nothing to do with faith. They just do it to look good. And so it's easy to be religious without ever being converted. It happens all the time in our society. So Paul then flips this idea on his head again because it's not what someone does but the depth of their relationship with Christ that makes all the difference. And that's why he describes. He cuts away in verse 7 and says, whatever I counted, whatever gain I had, I counted for loss. He says, indeed, I count. I consider everything lost the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. He said, there's something more important in life. There's something more important than the things that you own the things that you've done, the accomplished. Have you ever seen, I've seen this a few times, where uh, someone had, they had great athletic achievements in the past. They got all these trophies. They got trophies. They got all the good things they've done. They only talk about what they've done, not where they are now. They need to throw away the trophies. That's one of the things that's, that's interesting. Uh, what do you want to get rid of in order to know Christ? Paul says, all the things I've relied on in my whole life, I can't rely on any longer. Because that's not going to help me know Christ. That will help me look good. So he says, there's this surpassing, this overwhelming uh, worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a story of the merchant who, when he goes out, he knows the value of things, and he finds the pearl of great price, and it says, and he sold everything that he had to be able to buy that one thing. This is what Paul was doing, selling everything he had for that one thing. The most important thing was knowing Christ. Knowing Christ, that's, we use that term, knowing <coughs> American society has polluted that. We have made it, uh, we go to school to learn to know. And so we have equated it with facts and with academic knowledge of being able to pass the SAT at a high score, get into the college of your choice because you know a lot, and uh, become a, a font of completely useless information. And that's how we think about it. The problem is the Bible doesn't use it that way. 
it uses it, it you may see it at the very beginning. The Hebrew, especially, Paul was steeped in it, so he's using a Hebrew concept here. Um, Genesis chapter 4, after Adam and Eve had been banished from the garden, it says that Adam knew his wife, and she conceived to bear a boy's son. He talked about the intimacy of that. That you know that way. And that's what the sense is that have that kind of closeness and intimacy that is all there. I think marriage is probably a good idea, a good way of looking at this. Because when you're married, something happens. The longer you stay married, the uh, the more you think alike. That's that's frightening. <laughs> Yeah, you start finishing each other's sentences. But if you finish them wrong, she'll say, you never listen to me. Um, but, but you begin to think alike. And so you're not two but one. That's what Paul says about marriage. That you're no longer two but one flesh. That you, you move in connection. That's why when a spouse dies, the truth is something of the person dies at the same time. That's knowing. That's the knowledge that Paul speaks of. He said, I want to know him. I want to, to be like him. I want to think like him. I want to act like him. I want to be like him. I don't even want to suffer like him. I want to die like him. Powerful element there. He said, there's a, it's a paradox though. Paul says, I gave up all that law stuff. To know Christ. But it says, those who know Christ obey what God says. Obedience is not a problem for that. This is not a dichotomy that says you either know Christ or you obey, obey God. No, if you know Christ, you're willing to obey like he did. But there are those who obey that they don't necessarily know Christ. They just go through the rules. They're religious. So, the person who knows Christ is also is doing what God wants him to do. So finally, Paul says, but I'm not there yet. He has this constant pursuit. Paul's going to change his image here. He has, Paul has his favorite view. He has a, he has a favorite metaphor he likes to use. He uses it to the Corinthians, he uses it to the Ephesians, he uses it to Timothy, and he uses it here. And that is the the foot race. I don't know what Paul did, but I have a feeling he likes to watch people run. Because he seems to always talk about it. And he saw something in, in that experience that fits Christianity. And so he says, let's talk about the race we're running. He said, I haven't gotten there yet. Now when he gets to 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's going to say, I have finished the race, because he's at the end of his life. But he's not there yet. And it says, I'm not there yet, but the word of obtain is I haven't gotten the completeness that I need to get there. I think when he dies for Christ, for Christ, that's when he completes the race. That's when he knows Christ the way he really wants to know Christ. But I press on to make it my own. It's a word that has an interesting idea to it. And when you when you see this word in verse 12, you have seen it before in the original language above this. To press on means to pursue something to exhaustion. <clears throat> it's like a bloodhound sniffing the scent. And uh, they won't let up until they find what they've smelled. It is that kind of pursuit. It's hounding someone. He uses the same word in verse 6. But we read it this way. I was a persecutor of the church. Same word. Now why does Paul repeat himself? I think it's because he said, with all the passion I put into extinguishing Christians, is all the passion I'm putting into making 
I am pursuing just as hard as I always have for a different cause. And he was willing to say, that's what I'm going to do. He said, I haven't, I haven't made it. He said, but I press on to what lies ahead to the goal of the prize, the high calling of the Christ Jesus. I'm going to try to get there. He pushed it. I have a question for this this lesson that comes out of this. When is a person truly converted? You know, there, there are people that, uh, and I've done it to people too, that we baptize them and then suddenly you never see them again. And I'm afraid our theology has made baptism the only requirement, the only idea. And, and yet, that's kind of like starting a race, having the gun go off. You take two steps and you sit down on the track and say, I'm done. You haven't run anywhere. You haven't gone anywhere. Instead, you're, you're, you're just sitting there. And everybody else is running the race. You're not converted yet. When, when are you converted? See, this is a question that Paul wants to answer in this. He said, when you know enough to release what's holding you back, and hold tight to what's going to get you where you need to go. Releasing is hard. Uh, we hold on to a lot of things for a lot of reasons. Uh, when I retired, one of the things I had to do was, and I sat there and stared for about a week and a half, knowing what I needed to do, was I had a wall full of books. I bought books when I didn't have money to buy books, i got to tell you. I was making $12,000 a year. I was buying books every month. And so you look at that and say, that's an investment of your lifetime. But all of a sudden they hit me and said, what good are these going to do me now? I haven't touched some of them in 20 years. And I really doubt I'm going to do that plus I didn't have space. So I boxed in this library. I think there was 24 boxes of books. Took them to half price books. They gave me $120, $15,000 worth of books. After the reason. When I was seven years old, we had gone to a fair, the state fair of New Mexico in Albuquerque. We came home, I had gotten the blue. And I had something else, but I remember I was trying to hold these two things together. And as I tried to hold them, the string of the balloon let go and disappeared. Much to my dismay. Sat there bawling like a baby over a balloon. But you know, one of the things that, that's what we do. We, we ball like a baby over the stuff that we want that, that's here, and that somebody get us where we need to go. Paul says, Are you going to let go of something to get you where? want to be. 